Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Factory. I'm Heidi Hörnlein, the co-founder of the Wisdom Factory, and we are in contact, in conversation with people all over the world to talk about interesting topics, conversations that matter. And today I have Christine Dorn from Australia, far away from Italy where I live, and she wants to share with us her experience at the Integral European Conference this year, where we, Mark and myself, were not able to go, although we would have loved to go, because Mark was already ill and about to die. So now, firsthand, I would like to hear something about it. But before we start, I would like to invite you, Christine, to talk a little bit about you, who you are, and, and so on. You know, the, the normal introduction, <laughs> and then we start about the conference, okay? Thank you, Heidi, and thank you so much for the invitation to come along and um, be part of this conversation, which I'm very keen to do. Um, first of all, I'm going to just make a few general comments about who you're hearing from, because I'm in Australia, but I was actually born in America. I've lived where I live right now for almost 50 years, so I'm getting a bit long in the tooth, but I still have a bit of an American accent, so don't be fooled. This is not an Australian accent. It's a modified American accent. And I have only in the last 15 years um, become acquainted with the whole integral theory or integral meta, meta theory. It's revolutionized my life. I am such a devoted integralist and I'm so thrilled that I went to the first IEC conference, the first Integral European conference. It was such an amazing experience. I wasn't able to go the second time because um, I wasn't, I was, I was recovering from an operation. And, uh, but the third time I was determined to be there. And so I went in 2018 and actually was able to deliver a workshop, which I'm so thankful to the IEC uh, coordinators for. It was a great experience. I learned a lot, but I would love to talk about whatever we want, whatever your listeners want to hear. More about me coming to Australia, more about my stumbling into Integral, more about my growing up as an Integralist, uh, more about where I want to go with uh, the Integral framework, more about IEC, more about you direct me, Heidi, and I'll go there. Yeah, I'm very glad that you said that it has re revolutionized your life, the, the meeting with the ideas of, of integral theory. And it was, oh my dog, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was so for me too. And um, I would like to, to talk, you to talk a little bit more about that because one of the intentions of the Wisdom Factory is bringing integral theory into the world because it's so helpful. And still so many people, when I talk about integral, uh, what is that? Uh, they don't really get it. What, 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 what life looks like when you have this framework, this roadmap. And if you could talk a moment uh, about that, what, what your insights were when you uh, met this Ken Wilma. Well, I must say that I've had so many insights through Integral. Uh, my introduction to Integral and my continuing um, engagement with the Integral theory and with Integralists that I, I can't even begin to cover that. It would take us hours and hours and hours. But when I first met Integral Theory, I was working with a very interesting integralist in Brisbane named Peter Bureau. And Peter's website is called Europower. And I was absolutely stunned, stunned that somebody had written up drawn out this amazing roadmap that not only got you from where you are to where you want to go, but it told you where you are. And it could locate where you want to go. And it could locate what was perhaps a better destination for you. And I've never seen a methodology or a map of life that actually told me, I'm here, I want to go there, 
this is the way. Yeah, and, and also, so, also yeah. The, the, for me, it was also important to explain why we are here, the route we, we can. Absolutely. <laughs> That's normally what we don't want to hear, no? Our past, how <laughs> it led us, and how we developed through the through times as humanity and as single human beings. And for me, this was the oh, now I know why women stayed at home and you know things like that, and why we had the patriarchy. It made so much sense, no? And still, people are struggling today because they they don't get it. They think the men are oppressing the women. Oh no, it's not that. So sorry, I interrupted. <laughs> no, but you, you're saying you're saying exactly the kind of things that I would say. That is to say that there is a there's a complete historical understanding of where I not only fit sort of um, in my psycho spiritual development, in my business development, in my intellectual development, but also in the historical development of culture, that there's this beautiful map. And to this day, my favorite, I love giving presentations or doing workshops or doing public speaking. I'm one of those people who, boy, if you show me a microphone, I will elbow everybody out of the way to get to it. I'm not, I'm not a shy public speaker, but, but my favorite presentation, and it's quite an original one, I must say, it uses, of course, the um, historical cultural development that is so clear in, uh, in Wilbur's theory. But it, the, the title of that talk is, uh, what is the apprenticeship of the 21st century? I won't tell you, I won't give away the answer, but it goes through apprenticeships from 10,000 years ago, right through every developmental stage. And of course, I make the audience tell me about, say, an apprenticeship to be a hunter-gatherer, an apprenticeship to be a farmer, an apprenticeship to be a scribe, an apprenticeship to be an administrator, you know, things like that, an apprenticeship to be a scientist or part of the manufacturing, the industrial revolution. And then we finally get to the 21st century. But I feel like that, that developmental aspect that, that brings all of history into me and me into all of history is so, so, so important. And it makes me connected to the whole human race. It makes me connected to the planet. It makes me connected to, makes me feel connected to other people in a way that I've never felt connected to them before. And I felt connected to myself in a way that I could never feel connected to myself before. Now, mind you, that was not my first day <laughs> on integral um, training course. <laughs> you know, yeah. the first day was like, <laughs> really? Yeah, and I was just overwhelmed, overwhelmed. That's the thing so because it's the, it's a little bit, uh, it seems at the beginning, a little bit difficult to understand. But in the meantime, there are so many people who have sort of broke it down into chunks and can explain it a little bit more, um, how do you say, understandable mm -hmm. than the master himself. Because the master himself tried to put everything in, in, into every aspect into his uh, writings. And so sometimes you, you know, you get a little bit lost. Uh, and uh, when you find somebody who is first bringing it together, or even he has uh, written a book, a short book, uh, Integral Vision, I think uh, it is called. I have to I, right. I will post it in the, um, in the, in the description. Uh, uh, with pictures and so on, that's easier to understand. But I think the easiest thing is to go into circles where integralists are and ask them. And for me, it has been a, good practice to need to explain somebody what is integral. At the beginning, I didn't know what to say, but slowly you get it. And so you learn it. It is a thing which will because it psychoactive. When you once have gotten the, the, the idea, oh, that's what something, and you go and you go and it is working in yourself and then you get interested and it, you learn and learn and learn and you begin to see the world in a, in a, different way in a much more how do you say favorable way without uh, ignoring the negative sides but you begin to understand 
the negative sides or the, the sides which we consider negative at the beginning. And I, I stop in a minute, but yesterday I saw the contribution of Jeff, Jeff Sausman about this um, Kavanaugh uh, judge no, in, in, yes. in America. And he is very good in, in, in stating where this person are at. And, you know, uh, understanding the position. And we all, once when we are integralists or whoever we are, we have done these stages in our development. And there was a time where we would think, oh, a behavior like this is normal, you know. And he is still in, uh, in this uh, idea that it is completely normal and what does this uh, woman want, you know. But it's not because he is a bad person, but because he is in that stage of development, his mindset is there. And Jeff does a good work in explaining this. So I don't know if you have seen it. But... Yes, I saw it. I, I don't think it was most, Jeff's most brilliant work, but yes. Jeff has put together so many brilliant programs and of such a high standard right across the board. Uh, look, I don't miss a single Jeff Salzman uh, podcast. I just won't miss them. I, I love them. It's like feeding candy to a kid, you know. I, I just can't wait for the next one. He is, and, and he's such a lovely person. Yes, he is. <laughs> such a lovely man. Yeah. I met him at the first uh, Integral Europe conference. Me and, too. Uh, and, and I did go to the Integral Living Room in Colorado as well. Oh, oh good. And Jeff is just, well, he's just as gorgeous as he is in life as he is on his podcasts. We're so lucky to have Jeff Salzman. He has such a, such a deep understanding and he is really oh. helping you to see the world from a different perspective, you know. Sure, yes. it was not his most brilliant thing, but, you know, people are so divided and they're so polarized yeah. and what, and he really succeeds to, 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 to help you to understand things and get them together instead of buying into the polarization become even you part of the polarization. And that's what we really should uh, I certainly agree. I, you know, he's just a treasure. Yeah, I will put that in the description too. I had him on yes, several, <laughs> several times he was with us on the Wisdom Factory and it was always yeah. a joy. And actually, we introduced him to video because up to that point, he always wanted only audio. And then we said, uh -huh. it would be so much nicer if you if he could see you, you know, and so he did all the effort in coming with us in video and he had still Brett who was helping him and so now he is so normal on video and I'm really grateful. So fluent. He's anyway. so fluent. <laughs> we didn't He's want got to, a great presence. Yeah, we didn't want to talk about him but more about you and about mm -hmm. your impression of the integral conference. We met at the first one and then we met also yes. Germany at the Integral Integralis Forum on the one yes. of the meetings. Uh, tell, tell me a little bit about this year's uh, Integral Conference, which we were twice, it was always <gasps> nurturing for the whole year. So tell me a little bit how was the third one and then about your workshop. Well, if you look behind me with the falling of the of darkness, you can still see that I live in the rainforest in far north Queensland in Australia, so the very far northeastern part of Australia. I've lived here for almost 50 years. It was a choice I made as a very young person. It was a choice I never regretted. And, uh, but it's a funny place. It was pretty empty when I came here. It was pretty hard to find. You had to, be, you had to have your radar on and your antenna up to find the place because it wasn't well marked even on the maps and nobody knew what was here, but it is still, although it's been discovered, it's still far away. Although we have an international airport an hour and a half away, it's still far away. You know, it takes us hours to go anywhere. Even the state capital is 2,000 kilometers away. The top of the state is another 1,500 kilometers away. The western border is 1,500 kilometers away. It's huge, Queensland. And so in a rural outpost, there aren't many integralists. There are a few. I, I really appreciate the ones who are here, but I don't have a big, strong integral community. I've been slowly trying to build one up, but I have to go elsewhere to look for this part of my life. Just like I had to go to Germany to learn my 
equestrian training because the Germans were the best in dressage at the time, the undisputed world leaders. So I went to Mecca where the best were and I trained with the best. I didn't become the best, but I trained with the best. And I go with the same attitude into everything I'm really interested in. And I'm really interested in integral theory and I'm interested in integral practice. So I was determined to go to that first International European Conference and I had people warn me off because they said things like, oh, well, you know, it'll be like the American ones where everybody's really in their head and it's all about academics peeking at each other about minor points of theory. And of course we turned up and even in 2014, was that the first one, 2014, it was a revelation to me. All these beautiful people, I mean, I think there were 400 of us at that time, all sitting up beautifully straight on their chairs at the, in the first meditation. They all knew how to meditate, they all knew how to sit, they all knew how to be silent, they all knew how to look into each other's eyes. And after the keynotes, we spent the rest of the morning doing intellectual work, academic work. It was fabulous because it was more than academic work. It wasn't just somebody blabbing at the front of the room mostly, it was really mixing it up in workshops. After lunch, beautiful lunch, off we went to do emotional, somatic, spiritual work. I mean, incredibly in-depth workshops where you were either working from the heart, from the hara, or from every part of your being. Just amazing. And then in the evening, of course, we had integral comedy, integral dancing, integral uh, spirituality, integral community, and then that amazing constellation. I mean, IEC is integral. I don't care what they do in America or whether they are just off the charts with uh, blah, blah. I, I mean, I know that's not every integral greet, greet and meet in America, but it, America had a bit of a reputation for that. But the IEC, the Integral Europe Conference, is just integral to its core. And where can you go in the world where 400 people, and this year it was 610, all know integral theory, where you could probably sit down with almost everybody there and say, gee, I'm really, I find you really interesting. I sort of resonate. I, we haven't talked. Could we just sit down and do a bit of eye gazing and then have a conversation? Where could you go and do that? Where could you go and do that? And you could do that at the Integral European Conference. And what I notice in this tribe, we, we, Benze calls a tribe, and it is a tribe. Yes, it's a tribe. Yeah, we have such a different way of being together, so uh, more authentic. So, you know, you, there is a, uh, an atmosphere in the room which is amazing. It's, it's a, you feel like really being part of a group, of a, of a, a well-meaning group, and not only well-meaning, but also well-understanding and Tolerant is not the right word. It's much more than tolerant. It's, it's embracing something like that, you know. You have the feeling, now here I can be who I am. And that was for me the reason why I always went to, to Germany for the yearly conferences, because like you, I'm in Italy and there's no integralist around. And I had these ideas and nobody to talk to. And so since 2000, I think, I went every year to Germany to find people with whom I didn't have to to make myself understood and get their strange gazes. But it was clear. And with them, the, the, being is easy. It's sort of, you know, no, no problem. There is no, I don't know how to, how to say this, but it's really nurturing in, in all aspects of the being, mentally, with the core, as, uh, with the heart, as you said, and, and the hara, every, everything is nurtured there. And, being together is the most natural thing of the world, you know. And for Mark, uh, coming back, because I'm writing uh, the ebook for him, uh, I put in the photo. He was then uh, in the constellation Henry Kissinger. 
And oh, I'd forgotten that. <laughs> yeah. And for him, it was a great deal also to be on the stage. He had never been on the stage. He was not one who would take the microphone first. Not at all. He would hide. And inside of this group of people, he was encouraged to be himself and to show up and to to be on stage. And to, you know, that was also the basis for our Wisdom Factory because before he wouldn't, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't have become yeah. public, it is, let's say. So it is, it is enhancing the personal development as well as, you know, the community, as well as your insights in the world. And you, you create from there so many initiatives in the world have, have started, you know, with people who use this knowledge of the integral roadmap for their business or for their intentions, for their groups. Uh, yeah, uh, you see, I'm as excited as you are. Or thought this yeah, we're, <laughs> we're fans. We're both converted fans. Yeah. But, you know, it is interesting that you can't find a word for that in English. Now, I'm a native English speaker and quite an articulate one, but I can't find an English word for that. But there is one in German. Because, as you know, I also speak German. Uh, it's a second language, or it's a third language for me. But uh, I love German, and there is um, there is a German word for that, and I think it's selbstverständlich. But hmm. yeah, because it, we do have that feeling of going to the IEC and selbstverständlich naturally. Uh, it goes without saying, however you'd say it in English. But we don't quite have that word. Everyone is on the same vibe, and you can tune in to that vibe. And I think that there's something even more important for me, and that is that I have made a real modus operandi out of deciding I was going to learn something and then going and working with the best in the world or the best that I could find. So that was why I went to Germany for my dressage career, because the German, that was Mecca. So why wouldn't I go to Mecca? I went to Mecca. I worked with the living legend of German dressage. May he rest in peace. He's now the legend of German dressage. But that's where I got my inspiration and my training. And I feel the same way about Integral, that the way for me to feel uplifted, to expand, and to just learn more, just learn more, that I can then integrate, that that only happens in this intense manner when I can be with people who are so far ahead of me that all I can do is just be in their vibration and be lifted up. And I love that about that week at uh, the Integral European Conference. I love it. Yeah, I do believe that. And I'm still sad that we were not there. But next time, I will come alone. <laughs> Great. Great. Anyway, you did a workshop and I would like you to, to talk a little bit about what and how it was received and all, all around. Okay. Okay. You know what, what comes to me first is what I personally learned, not the subject, not the theme, not the matter, not the, what was the workshop was about, but what I learned. And it was, to me, it was just fascinating because it was, a, it, was a, um, it was a case study for myself in my own behavior of where, how my um, different levels of understanding and activity interact together. So if you think that I've always been, uh, I mean, I was brought up in an American business family, upper middle class uh, and uh, well-educated. And of course, from a very tiny, tiny child, I was encouraged to be, and I was born in 1949. Hello, I'm ancient. You know, I'm a real proper baby boomer. I was, I was encouraged to be outgoing, extroverted, on the front foot, friendly, articulate, uh, and always, always positive, always optimistic, always having the best ideas, always being out there, always being the first one in the room to shake somebody's hand or smile or, you know, I'm a real, either a completely trained extrovert 
or I really was an extrovert to start with, then I had extroversion training. But of course, that was a great persona for what, uh, what all of us would call orange mean, what Terry O'Fallon might call 3.5, what, uh, what uh, Suzanne cook Reuter would call uh, achiever. You know, that just fitted my persona perfectly. So how interesting is it that I've moved wider and more expansive than that in my, in my learning about integral theory and my practice of integral theory. But when I got to the conference, something happened to me that had never happened to me before. And I knew it was the format was like this, but I didn't really register that I was going to have this reaction. So as you know, Heidi, what you do in order to advertise and promote your um, talk is you give a little uh, teaser. A li there's a little three minute intro. You have a little advertising session. One minute. All I think. One minute. Me. It wasn't it. Only it might have been one minute. I don't know. It's not very many minutes. Short, really? Yeah, I think you're right. It's one minute. So you get up on stage and you rattle off who you are and what you are and what you're doing. Now, of course, how interesting is that? I wanted to be the person that I've grown up to be in my workshop. But just before my workshop, I actually had to almost pull myself back to that achiever, to that orange meme, to that performer, to that really bright spark on stage. And in fact, I did a great job. I did my one minute. We had, I had helpers who had signs. I was very animated. And Terry O'Fallon was at the bottom of the stairs and gave me a big hug. Oh, Christine, that was fantastic. You, you should do that more often. Yes, of course. But what it did was bump me down into an earlier stage of development. When I got to the workshop, I couldn't quite find my way out of achiever status, out of orange meme. I couldn't quite expand back into, into green integral. I, I, I just, I struggled because I just practiced in front of this huge audience being a person that I no longer have to be, but I'm really good at being. <laughs> so I practiced it a lot. So some of my learning was how, my most important learning was I have to be able to be more flexible in my use of different levels of development in different levels of co different capacities. And it was just fascinating to me to see how stuck I got into that inappropriate level of, of, uh, of uh, development that for the workshop wasn't the person that I really wanted to be, the workshop leader, the facilitator, the bringer together that I really wanted to be. And so I felt sort of, dislocated about the whole workshop. I was glad to do it. I'm really glad I did it, but what a thing to learn. Oh, okay. I never have to do my workshops where I have to be very present, where I have to focus on the other, where I have to allow for polarities, where I don't talk about uh, oppositions, where it doesn't become a debate, but it becomes this expansive conversation. What do you I are just about? I didn't quite nail that, and I, I now I'm very conscious of having to make those moves and be more flexible and fluid. Does it make sense to you? Absolutely, because it, it, that's what I feel in integralist. We have a certain level of consciousness, but we are still uh, sort of stuck into our own level. Also, we know this before, and it's, you know, by chance, I'm now preparing for the next German-speaking women's meeting, uh, the, the language of uh, the, the levels of consciousness, because we need to practice that. You are talking now the whole behavior. We start with the language. What language do we need to speak when we want to reach people of different levels of consciousness? And we are not really super good in it. Yeah, good to talk with Not us. At all. <laughs> you know, oh, we're, 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 you know, to put it quite frankly, I'm crap at it. 
<laughs> yeah. And, you know, if, if your women's group only didn't come on the air at 2 a.m. in Australian right. time, and, I would be there in a minute. And I might even set my alarm and get there because this is such a fascinating topic for me. Yeah, we and need to learn German as well as English. I would be thrilled, Heidi. I love it yeah. that you're doing that. You are invited. And, and this is, oh, no. in my opinion... Yeah, in my opinion, is really what we are now needing to do for to be really able to, to make peace, let's say. We need to be able to easily change into the language, even in red language, which might be quite aggressive. We don't want to be aggressive, so we, we don't want to speak like that. But in certain settings, you have to speak like this. Or the blue language, no, the blue or other colors which uh, yeah. we use as... Uh, we don't want that anymore, this orderly stuff, but we need to learn it because otherwise we talk right over the head of these people who actually are uh, yearning for guidance. I really am sure they are yearning for guidance because otherwise not so many people would have voted for Trump, uh, you know, <laughs> maybe, uh, you know. I agree. Yeah, so uh, for me that all these things also in Germany, what happens here in Italy, it's all a protest of people, not all, but a big part of it, of people who just don't see another way. And if we, yes. who think we know better, uh, if we have not the possibility to convey what we have learned and what we know, it's really a problem. And so I think it's a good idea to make even workshops on that, uh, come together several days and work on that, make role play and, and learn how to use the language of the different levels. Because otherwise- I love that, Heidi. And I would say, because I got so stuck in, in, in an inappropriate um, level of not only speech, but behavior mm -hmm. at the IEC. I mean, what a huge learning for me. I mean, what an opportunity to learn something about myself that very few, I would never have that opportunity anywhere else. But the difficulty then of being able to flex flow from one level to another, holy dooly, I am, I'm no good at that. And what a revelation and what an important revelation. A bit disappointing for my performance, so to speak, at the workshop, but such an important insight into myself. Such an important insight. Where else would I get an insight like that? I, you'd have to be among integralists to be able to get that insight. Mm -hmm. And the and thing to be forgiven for any of your faults, for any of the flaws in your flex flow. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and that's the, the place where we can learn it because in everyday life, it's more difficult. You only realize that that was not the right way to address this problem with that person. Yes, I see that often, but I'm not yes. really sure what to do. And I think our inability to do exactly this is also the reason why Integral is not widely known as it should be, as a, a very important tool for, <clears throat> for important change in the world, because probably we are not able enough to, to convey it to people uh, who, who might use it. You, you don't have to be in an Integral stage yourself. You can be in an orange stage, but you can use Integral tools for what you are doing. But if you don't understand it, because we are not able to, to tell you, uh, you know, we miss out on that. And I think that we should formulate that a little bit more and learn it a little bit more too. You know, it's, it's, it's so much easier to be under Integralists, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But I love your idea, Heidi, and I love that initiative because I actually hadn't thought of putting it together like that, but didn't I need that learning right then? And wouldn't I love to be benefiting from that learning right now? And I need it every day in my life, and I'm struggling to practice it. So uh, that might be an idea to set up <clears throat> a workshop, an online workshop for interesting people. Interesting and interested people and that we do that maybe um, twice or three times a week for, for, for a month or so because we shouldn't have too much uh, interval in between because then we forget. <laughs> or we make a right. whole day workshop or something, which with you is difficult because our day is your night. <laughs> <laughs> it's night now and the sun's coming up for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
So we, I, we have to figure that out. But thank you for the hint. And I, 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 I think about it. Mm -hmm. Please do, because I think that would be a huge contribution. I, I mean, you and Mark have already made a huge contribution, but I think this is a real way of taking your contribution forward. And I, I, as I say, I just love that idea and that I feel it's necessary. Yeah. And it's not that I can teach that. We have to fi figure that out together, you know, together. there is nobody really, really expert in that, you know, and that makes no. it <laughs> inspiring. Anyway, let us go to your workshop now. What what was your workshop about? Well, it it was a it was an integral comparison of America and Australia because of course, born as an American and spending 50 years in Australia, I feel like I've got a foot in each country. I mean, of course, I have another foot in Germany because I mean, why did I go to to Germany? Well, let's do another interview about that because as I've said to many German integral friends of mine, I went to Germany to discover my inner Nazi. <laughs> you know, what can I say? And the Germans are the, the one nation in the world that I know of that has really, really worked on its past and trying to integrate its past and trying to see where its past came from. But I won't go into that now, just my absolute admiration for the way Germany has done that and for the way in particular America has just said, I don't see anything, you know? And the Germans have looked long and hard. So I went to Germany to be able to look at myself long and hard along with all those Germans looking at themselves long and hard <laughs> at our Nazi pasts, if you see what I'm saying. And I, I think that that's a, that's a, that's a really, really important point that I, I really want to talk about sometime. But you know what, Heidi? I got so busy on that one, I forgot your question. <laughs> My question was <laughs> Sorry. about the content of your workshop. Yes, yes of course. Yes, of course. Here we go. <laughs> so it was, a, it was an integral comparison. It was a bit of an out there comparison of Australia and America culturally. And uh, it, it, it actually, I mean, I, I did it. I, I've been I've been making this comparison in my head for ever since I got here, because of course America and Australia seem so similar. We all speak English. I mean, we drive on the left and they drive on the right, but and the buildings look a little different. The climate's a bit different, but in fact, and there aren't many Australians. There are lots of Americans, but in fact, those are two societies that seem so similar, and yet they are really very different, more than you would expect from the linguistic similarity. So pondering this over years and years, decades, I finally came upon integral theory. And then eventually I put integral theory together with my theoretical ideas about what was the difference between America and Australia. And I came up with quite an original thesis or one that I thought was quite original. And that was that there's a really strong connection in Australia that doesn't, that you don't see quite the same way in America. So let's just pick on America first because that's the easy one to see. So there's a real red orange axis in America. And we should, we should shortly say what red orange uh, means. Can, could you say? Yes, well, Red is the more um, ethnocentric uh, and quite a bit more conformist, can oh, also be quite aggressive. Yeah. So it's, it's feudal, you know, it's sort of feudal aristocracy. So we see red societies or red governments in places like Afghanistan. Um, and for those of us in the first world, well, there are plenty of red mean people, but, but in fact, most of us aspire to something a little better than um, feudal warlords or, or um, bikey gangs or uh, drug gangs fighting with each other, you know, where the big guy powers everything. And it doesn't matter whether you have the biggest uh, army, the biggest bank account, the biggest car, the most gold bling all over you, the most in the bank, the biggest dick. Whatever it is that you got the biggest of, it's very masculine, it's very aggressive, it's very power oriented. The good part of red, of course, is that it's very protective and it's very, 
uh, it pulls everybody together because it's very conformist and uh, maybe not everybody, but, but the family, the tribe, the tribe, uh, the family and the tribe, exactly. The people who are in the in group, yes, are very much pulled together. So then, orange meme is much more about the post enlightenment revolution. So we've only had this going for 400 years max. And it's all about science. And then out of that came manufacturing, came the industrial revolution, came the scientific revolution. And eventually, of course, that from the enlightenment to about the 60s in the States, that was absolutely the leading edge of culture. It was the leading edge. But it's a very strong, strong, strong component of American culture. Is Orange, it, yeah. Yeah. capitalism, meritocracy, make, make your money, God wants me rich. Yeah, and also the, the mythos that uh, by washing plates, uh, you can become rich, no? Why people went to America. This, uh, yes, that there's unlimited has, uh, possibilities. Yeah, and that uh, you, you can need to explore what you can do and where you can arrive and you will when you do it right. Yes, that's it. But there is a pure meritocracy, which of course we know is uh, an absolute fable. That's a myth, but, but in fact, many people in America did manage that. And many people in Australia who came as very poor immigrants, they're still doing it. Make, having that American dream, which is disappearing, it, the, it, Australia still shows that American dream. And I'm sure it happens in America still too. But the interesting thing about that is that the integral movement basically came out of America and it is very strong. And there's a very strong green meme that's a more pluralist, more inclusive. That's the, that's the area where everybody is allowed to have a voice and we have to listen to everyone's voice. So it's a very different feel and a very much more collectivist and collaborative feel than the orange meme, which is very individualist, I'm going to succeed, get out of my way. Remember how I described my elbowing people out of the way to the microphone? Very orange meme. <laughs> Perhaps a little too aggressive for pure orange, but maybe a bit of red in there too. So to me, the really strongest axis for America is red and orange. But if you look at Australia, if you feel into Australia, I don't mean if you listen to the pundits, if you look at TV, or if you look at how elections work, because they look not too dissimilar from America, unfortunately. But the heart of Australia is actually its lowest level, where it's really, really, really comfortable, is blue. Everything's orderly, we're very British, we don't laugh too much, we don't get too excited about things, we're very friendly, but we're really friendly. Not like Americans who say, oh, you have to come over for lunch. And if you turn up for lunch, they go, what? <laughs> Australians really mean it. <laughs> but, but, but it. But there's this bureaucracy and this, um, uh, what in America they call nanny statism, and I sometimes go with that too, where we want to make sure that everybody starts with the same rules, the rule of law is very important, the equality of, of, of that kind of opportunity, equality before the law, all of that is very important to Australians. And it's not a, there, there's something very um, collective about it. There's something, and, and very unindividualistic. It's we all have the same regulations, we all have the same laws, we all have the same understanding of how we're going to, how we're going to work together as a society. So the individualist reds, who are pretty aggressive, and the individualist oranges, who are very successful, really don't love that. You know how Americans carry on about big government? Well, we kind of like big government. We kind of like to be regulated here in Australia. We like it that we had seat belts way before Americans did, that we made plain packaging happening, happen on cigarettes, that we look after people, that we have what Americans call socialized medicine. Well, when I got here, hospitals in Queensland were free. How nice is that? 
and we still have a great health system, people are looked after and everyone is looked after. So the other part of the axis for Australia is the green. That's, their, that's sort of their happiest high point. We basically, I mean, there are plenty of orange uh, capitalist, scientific, I'm going to succeed Australians, plenty of them, no problem. But the real axis at the depth of the Australian soul, I feel, goes from blue, really skips orange and goes to green. And what's green? It's more, it's back to the collective. It's collective, it's inclusive, it lets it allows everybody to have a voice. It's very interested in looking after people. And America, you look out for yourself. In Australia, you will be looked after. Now, I, I might just say, where did that come from? Because I've looked into the historical aspects of this as well. Well, I'll stop and think. America was settled by Puritans who sort of stumbled out of their horrible boats, having run away from those oppressive English uh, 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 religious bigots who wouldn't allow religious freedom. And they had religious freedom, all right. But what did they have in front of them, Heidi? What did they have in front of them? They had this country that was just rich beyond imagining and that they imagined to be empty. Well, <laughs> too bad about the inhabitants who were already there, who thought it was theirs. But you couldn't, if you were dissatisfied, if you had, if you failed, if you weren't happy with the whatever part of your society or yourself or your own life, all you had to do in America is go west and keep going west. It just got richer and richer and more opportunities came up and more opportunities. So who was dumped on Australian shores? Criminals, petty criminals. It was a prison colony and their military masters. So <laughs> Australians, in fact, didn't matter if you were part of the military, didn't part of, matter if you were a criminal, they couldn't live without each other. The place was too tough. You know, the trees didn't even lose their leaves, they shedded their bark and there were fires that went through the place and the soil was mostly sandy and rocky and it was uninviting, it was too hot and there were weird animals, they hopped instead of running and they, you know, birds that didn't fly and all kinds of weirdnesses and snakes and spiders as everybody hears about Australia, there aren't that many of them, but you know, we don't, not many people die of snake bites in Australia, a lot more die from car accidents. But who was it who founded Australia? And where did they land? What would it have been like if America had been settled as a penal colony? What would it have been like if religious freedom fanatics had come to Australia? Might have been a completely different story. However, you still have the dirt. You still have the lack of capacity for the continent of Australia to accommodate many people. We're still 25 million people in a continent almost as big as the US, the continental US. And in America, endless bounty, endless opportunities. So the other thing that made a difference historically is that America was founded 100 years earlier. So by the time Australia really hit its stride, there was an understanding that you couldn't just let capitalists run wild because they would oppress the working class. Fabian socialism was a very important part of it. The, um, there was more, if you will, politeness because we Australians, I get to be we everywhere, we Australians were more British. Uh, but in America, it was pretty rough and ready. And there was a lot of, I mean, there was a lot of opportunity, but people still fought over the opportunities. They fought over water in America like they fought over water in Australia. There's a lot less of it here than there is there. But that hundred years difference made a cultural difference, not just a difference to the geography or to the kind of people who came here, but there was a cultural difference. There was the collective feeling that was beginning to uh, pick up steam when Australia really hit its straps. It never got to the rubber baron stage unalloyed, unprotected. And Australia very quickly understood within a hundred years that it had to look after its people. It had to be a collective society. And uh, so you have the great Australian tradition of mateship, where your friends are more important than, uh, and, and the group that's going to protect you is more important than anything else. 
because you just can't survive on your own in the Australian bush. I don't care how clever you are. You have to have a tribe. You have to have your mates. And in America, you can thrive all on your own. Go for success, young man. Go west, young man. And that's where I see the biggest differences. They all came from those historical, geographical, and cultural uh, differences. This is so amazing to think about that on the one side, fanatic from the religion, they yeah. have this already this idea, fighting and going and going, and the others more humbled when you are a prisoner, you are for sure not in chains, <laughs> in chains and not, not very fanatic of, of doing anything and you are happy that you are surviving. And as you said, this is an interesting point that the guardians uh, were on the same boat, so they needed each other and so that the collaboration uh, can exist without any ideology in the head. That makes it. In fact, they needed each other more when they landed than on the boat, because on the boat they had provisions, they had a hierarchy, they had commanders, the, the prisoners had to follow orders, they were locked up in the, in the bilge. But the, uh, in, in fact, there's still a great Australian saying, we use the word chunder to throw up. Mm -hmm. And what that came from was there were several, several uh, layers on those boats, of course. And if you were in the bottom bilge, what the people at the top said, cried out when they, <laughs> when they had to throw up from seasickness was, watch out under, which got shortened up to chunder. <laughs> and we still call throwing up chunder. Anyway, that's, a, that's a, an aside. But the fact is that once they, got, once they stopped chundering from seasickness and got off the boat, in fact, the military leaders could not exert the same kind of authority that they were used to having in Britain. They, could, they too could not exist. They couldn't even survive without their mates. This makes a huge difference to the development of a country. So Australia still gravitates toward collectivism. America still gravitates towards individualism. And Look, it isn't that there aren't other strains. It isn't that there isn't a huge green population in America and that Integral is not well more advanced in America than Australia. It isn't that we don't have orange bean capitalists in Australia or successful people. But you would never have in America a thing like we have in Australia, which is called the tall poppy syndrome. So what happens to the tall poppy who grows up above everybody else? He gets cut off. <laughs> the tall poppy syndrome. And Australians are more inclined to ask everybody to stay at the same level, collective, look after each other. And Americans really want you to stick your head up and be a tall poppy. That's all that matters. The difference. So it's, it's a fascinating difference, isn't it? Difference in values. Completely. Big difference in values. And where did they come from? How did they develop? Oh. I have learned something today, and I'm sure people who will watch to that, they will learn that too. Because I, I have Australian friends, but uh, they were here even three or four times for half a year. We had a lot of conversations, but that never came up, you know? I never understood <laughs> the difference. <laughs> but Heidi, I can't help watching things, and I'm a pattern matcher. I mean... What does Ken Wilber say about his greatest capacity is to match patterns? But I am certainly no Ken Wilber. I haven't got his mental capacity. I haven't got his capacity to integrate things. I mean, he's just a hero of mine, but I can do pattern matching and I'm fascinated by matching patterns. And being so familiar with Australia and loving Australia so much and being so familiar with America and being a born American, I couldn't help matching the patterns. I, could, I couldn't not think about this. I've thought about this for decades. But it wasn't until I had the integral framework that I suddenly went, bing, I get it. Yeah. There were so many inexplicable things, elements to my whole argument until I learned integral theory. And then all of a sudden, chung, it all came together. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can understand it. Up to a certain point, I do it also with Italy. Uh, yes thinking that Italians are still very strong in red and, and blue in uh, um, 
conventional level. <laughs> they want to invent blue now because uh, <laughs> they put uh, traffic signs, uh, limits, speed limits now everywhere, you know, try to control the speeds, but they put <laughs> the mad drivers in Italy. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> no, no, I, uh, no, it's not that. And I, I like driving in Italy. But the thing, the absurd thing is that often these street signs don't make sense. It seems, oh, right. you know, there seems that they have, I don't know, a f fabrication of, of million uh, of these signs and then they put them everywhere. So you find f 50 kilometers in a place with, which is really large and you, why should you do 50 kilometers here? You can do 80, 90, 100, you know. And uh, yes, I, your sign. <laughs> on a big uh, four lane street, they, they uh, constrict you to 90 and you can go a little a country road and you can do 92 and which has all these curves you know or they put 70 in a place with with curves so that you hardly can arrive at 70 so you know and you are a system and then they leave the signs when they do roadworks they leave them there for ages so you get systematically educated to not obey them because they don't make sense and so ah. it is a difficult way to educate people when it doesn't make sense because people have also a sort of, you know, some mental capacity. And uh, so the attempt to c civilize people on the street goes completely wrong by a strategy like that, which is no strategy, I would say. You know? so, but the lack of strategy is itself an interesting point that you're making about Italy. And of course, you look at the same thing in America, people pretty much ignore the speed limit signs, it seems to me, they drive however they feel like driving. But in Australia, we actually pay attention because we're collective. Well, I mean, the police are after us too, if we you know, they've got all there. But they have, the same, they have the same regulatory equipment and punishment equipment in America, and nobody really seems to care as much. But here, it's, it's sort of almost a social constraint. Don't drive too quickly, you might hurt somebody. It's a very, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a very kind country, really, when you come right down to it. And I don't believe that America is a kind country. So someday, you and I have to have a talk about Italy and, uh, and see if we can come up with something when we have time. Okay. Come up with something that compares, say, Germany to Italy, because you, you really know those both, and I know Italy a bit and Germany a lot. We could have fun doing that. Yeah, I don't know Germany anymore so well. Uh, it's, it's, I'm here for 35 years now in Italy, so uh, I go only for visits. So I'm not sure if I still know it well, you know. So it has changed a lot in the last uh, decade. So, but I'm sh sure open to do that. But for today, I would say we leave it with that. And I'm very grateful for your explanation, which we did at the end, of, of the difference of the culture. And this is practically only possible when you use the integral map. Otherwise, you see there are differences, but you don't know what exactly where they come from, what they are. You find it crazy what the others are doing, and you are stuck in these considerations, which are very little precise. With integral theory, it comes, oh, yeah. I get it. This is the mindset. And out of this mindset, um, you know, or the mindset comes from this uh, context and so on. You can see it much more in clarity. This is my elevator pitch for people to get interested in <laughs> getting involved with integration. Well, my, my elevator pitch for that is it changed my life for the better. And when Ken Wilber says it's psychoactive, he has nailed it. Absolutely, I agree. And hopefully with this sort of conversations, we can convince, no, inspire <laughs> other people to, to get uh, involved into it. And there are now many people who are happy to help with the understanding when you don't get it. I still had to read it. And I, every afternoon I was three hours reading these papers and these books. And I thought, oh, but there was something which attracted me for years. Uh, until I understood something of it, it took me 10 years when we fin finally met in a woman's circle, live in person, and we, we learned about the quadrants. Uh, 
really we put the quadrants on the floor and uh, uh, put certain photos this belongs to that and this belongs to that and and or, or quotes or whatever and so i began to understand it really i mean maybe i still don't understand it 100 percent. i think we can't but uh, still learning but until this point where you think, oh, now I can use it. Now it's really not something out there, but it, I can use it for my own understanding and behave also differently in the world. You don't need to do the errors anymore, which you did without knowing and embodying it. Because knowing is one thing. I already knew several things, which I didn't really embody. And so I still fell into the trap of for instance, not responding on a red level to, to red people, but from a green level. And this really <laughs> wasn't doesn't a work. good idea. I had to pay doesn't for it. Work. <laughs> doesn't work. But we're all still learning. And that's one thing I really appreciate about the integral framework is that no matter how familiar you are and how much you've sort of incorporated it and embodied it, there's always another step. There's always another layer. There's always more to uncover. There's always more. And it doesn't stop helping you understand where you are and where you want to go. And also and where other people are so that you can um, yeah. connect it better with other people. It's so, so, so helpful. And it revolutionizes everybody who is getting deeply in says, ha, finally, that was things I was sort of aware but I, I didn't really know and now there is a structure in it in my knowledge uh, and and I can use it and this is really we did a lot of publicity for Ken Wilber today didn't we <laughs> <laughs> well you and I are really part of the sisterhood aren't we <laughs> we are fans <laughs> yeah, but not only fans it's it's uh, it's I would say how do you say it has become an integral part of our lives, which has... I uh, couldn't say it any other way. Yeah, yeah. And which is really so helpful, really so helpful, you know. But we talk about this another time. I thank you very much for today. And who is listening to us, when you are in Australia, connect with Christine. And when you're in Europe, Italy, wherever, uh, connect with me. But you can also from all over the world. We have email, we have uh, Zoom, we have Hangouts. We can be together. And if you have questions, ask them instead of saying, oh, I don't understand it. Okay. Thank you. Christine. Beautiful, Heidi. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, who listens to this. Thank you so much. And join us in the next conference in two years in Hungary. Yes. I'll be there. <laughs> I will be there too. Bye-bye. <laughs>